My name is Marsha Anderson. I grew up in the north end of Winnipeg, but my family roots go to the Norway House Cree Nation and the Peguis First Nation. Uh, and I'm very happy to be with you here today on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Before I really start, um, I've been doing a lot of reading lately on social innovation. And uh, one of the books in particular that I read described three types of innovators. And I just want to plant this idea so you can think about it potentially in terms of your roles uh, in reconciliation, which is probably the greatest complex social change and challenge that we have in Canada. Um, and so the three categories, first of all, are disruptive innovators. These are people like myself who have an ongoing and passionate intolerance for the status quo uh, and are constantly trying to think about ways we can create and build change. That's where I most naturally fit, although because of my jobs in two large mainstream organizations, I also have to play often this role of bridge innovators. And so bridge innovators are people who either help to translate the message or idea of um, disruptive innovators. We also, I think, need to start thinking about less in terms of um, providing voice to them, quote unquote, so much as using the access that we have as bridges to create space for disruptive innovators and organizations. But anyways, there are people who really have access to the people who have access to decision-making power. Um, and those people we can think of as receptive innovators if in fact they want to innovate. So receptive innovators are actually the people who have the power to create, to make different decisions, whether that be legislative or funding or policy. And that's actually a specific skill set too, to be able to be a receptive innovator. So I just wanted to start with that today and uh, encourage you to reflect throughout the day on what your role could be. In the wake of the Gerald Stanley trial, uh, and the significant injustice experienced by Colton Bushi, his family, his community, and Indigenous communities across this country. Um, I thought very long and hard for about a week after that about canceling all my talks that had anything to do with reconciliation. Because although I have, for the last couple of years, really tried to use it as a, a policy window, as a roadmap to restoring or really creating a rights-based relationship for the first time. I personally found also, in addition to the profound grief, a profound sense of betrayal um, about how we were approaching reconciliation in this country and really questioned my role in upholding what was not really a true reconciliation at all. Not just based on the injustice, but a lot of the public discourse around that injustice in the subsequent weeks. But I'm here, so obviously I did not decide to do that. Um, but I did want to own that as an Anishinaabekwe, it is a very difficult time to be on a podium talking about reconciliation. And that in addition to that trauma, um, as Indigenous woman and Tanya mentioned this last night too, as did, um, what's her name, Georgina? I blanked for a minute, yes. The weight of our own personal family and intergenerational experiences of trauma that we carry to these stages every time we are doing this emotional work. So I want to go back to something Marie Sinclair said, uh, which is that reconciliation will not be achieved if one side believes it's based on the recognition of rights and the other side believes it's an act of benevolence. And further, I want us. I want to encourage us to think about that act of benevolence or people who think it's an act of benevolence because there's people who think it's a necessary act of benevolence, but there's also a significant proportion of the Canadian population that thinks it's an unnecessary act of benevolence, that actually we shouldn't even be putting any effort into it. Um, and the responsibility that some people have in this room to try to shift that thinking. So to me, reconciliation is about structural change. It's about addressing multiple levels of racism 
uh, including interpersonal racism, which is the form most of us are familiar with, but also institutional racism, which Kamara Jones defined as the inequitable access to goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. It's often expressed as inaction in the face of need. Now, this particular quote is actually not about the Colton Bushy um, Gerald Stanley trial. This quote is from the 1991 Aboriginal Justice Inquiry of Manitoba, and it's in reference to the trial for the murder of Helen Betty Osborne, who was one of the first cases, um, or is often heralded as the first case of missing and murdered Indigenous women when they're talking about the uh, over 1,000 in the last 40 years. And the reason that I put this quote up here today is in addition to the ways that Tanya last night talked about inaction in the face of need, the circumstances uh, of the educational system going back over 100 years that are recreated today, uh, but that also Justice Sinclair was the lead commissioner of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. And almost 30 years ago, he also identified this structural disadvantage in jury selection. Um, and in almost 30 years, we have not actually taken action to address that. And so Indigenous people continue to face um, unequal protection under the law, despite the human right to have that. So I wanted to use Kamara Jones' allegory called the gardener's tale to, to just illustrate the multiple levels of racism and to help us think about it a little bit differently. So the gardener's tale is that there's a gardener and he has a pack of seeds for pink flowers and he has a pack of seeds for red flowers. And the gardener prefers red flowers. He just thinks they're better, they grow stronger, the flowers are more beautiful. And so he has a brand new flower pot flower pot and some nice lush new soil and so he plants the seeds for the red flowers into that flower pot. He goes out in his garage and he finds an old cracked pot and he fills that with some dry rocky soil that he has lying around and then he puts the seeds for the pink flowers into that flower pot. Over time he waters those seeds for those red flowers faithfully. If there's a few drops left in the water jug he might put them on the seeds for the pink flowers. Um, he gets the plant food that the red flower needs, and similarly, if there's a few grains left, he might throw them into the pot with the seeds for the pink flowers. He ensures that the flower pot that has those red flowers growing gets the right amount of sunlight and rotation that it needs, but he doesn't really bother with the seeds for the pink flowers at all. And over time, what he notices is that those red flowers do, in fact, grow healthy and strong, and even the weakest of them grows to at least an average height. Over the same period of time, most of the seeds for the pink flowers die off, and only the very strongest of them reaches an average height. And so the gardener looks at those two flower pots, and he says, see, I was right to prefer the red flowers all along. And I think if we reflect on, again, what Tanya was saying last night around the residential school system, and the current experience of Indigenous youth in this country, including the First Nations youth um, in the North who have to travel for high school, uh, communities that experience really high rates of youth suicide, we need to acknowledge that in the last 150 years, we have not collectively changed the flower pots or the soils in any way. And so I think one of the fundamental questions that we need to ask ourselves is why? And we're gonna of course relate that back to the notion or the idea or the definition of institutional racism, including that concept of inaction in the face of need. With this picture of Colton Bushy, I've already mentioned our lack of equal protection under the law. When we look at our picture of Tina Fontaine there, and we have to think about the multiple systems that she encountered within the last two days before her murder, before she landed in the bottom of the river, the number of systems she's encountered that had a legislated responsibility to serve her, to literally protect her as a child in need of protection because that is what she was. It was the health system, it was the police system, child welfare system. All of them had contact with her within the last 48 hours before she went in the river. And so she experienced multiple systems failure. 
And one of the challenges that I think with attributing some, something to systems failure is that no individuals are ever held accountable for it. So Raymond Cormier um, was found not guilty. Uh, they changed the law in Manitoba so that children who are, quote, in care, end quote, cannot be in hotels any longer. Uh, but they have not actually changed anything that increases the risk of First Nations kids being needed to be housed anywhere. And so we also need to keep in mind that systems are made of individuals and collectives of individuals who uphold those systems. And each of these systems, whether we're talking about parliament um, as the core of colonialism or the child welfare system or the justice system or the healthcare system, <laughs> I know it says 10 minutes, but I can't actually see it. Thank you. <laughs> when we're talking about those systems, we're actually talking about two systems at any given time, okay? And so one is the system of service that it is supposed to provide, health care, child protection. Uh, but the other system is the system of whiteness and race that this country is founded on, quite literally, right? So when white settlers came, they built this country on the notion that white people were superior and indigenous people were inferior savages. And that is why they formed the state and we were positioned legislatively as wards of the state. As a slight aside, um, one of the slides that I often use references work of Barner Hess, who's an African-American scholar. Um, and he talks a lot about whiteness, and he actually has a lecture you can find on SoundCloud called Unsettling Whiteness. And he talks about these eight action-oriented white identities. So first of all, I just wanna be clear that when I talk about whiteness, I'm talking about it as a system that advantages people in this country who were born with white skin and disadvantages people who are born in this country uh, with brown or black skin or come to this country. And I'm talking about whiteness as a system that is actively maintained and upholded by people who benefit from it. I think that is directly related to the reason why we have an action in the face of need demonstrated in so many ways uh, that put our children and our youth constantly at risk. And if you're able to Google those eight white identities, you will see that um, five of them really have a vested interest in maintaining or upholding that system of whiteness, okay? Because of the benefit that they receive from it. And the bottom three are the type of actions that we are trying to shift to. Sometimes people use the word ally. It's not my favorite. But the bottom three are white critical, white trader, and white abolitionist. And they really focus on white people speaking back to white people about racism and white privilege and actively working to dismantle those systems, as opposed to putting all of the weight for that on indigenous people and people of color. So let's just hold that idea also when we're thinking about our perspective, um, our respective roles in reconciliation. So I did have my kids yesterday actually at both Parliament and at the Canadian Museum of History. So we very much enjoyed seeing the Pegasus flag flying outside of Senator Sinclair's office um, and his staffer Natasha told us that his office is actually the only office in Parliament that has three flags outside of it. Um, so that is the only place where Indigenous nationhood is actually being actively represented in that way by a sitting Senator or MP. When we were at the Canadian Museum of History, um, one of the quotes that we came across was from our first Prime Minister. And it was immediately below a picture that included kids, and it said, and Indigenous kids. We cannot allow them to die for want of food. We are doing all we can by refusing food until the Indians are on the verge of starvation to reduce the expense. That was in 1882. And of course, he was referring to the way they, he um, encouraged the use of hunger to help clear the West for further and ongoing development by settlers. And when I looked at that picture with my children beside me, 
uh, and saw kids that our government actually chose to starve in order to access our land. And that was 130 years ago. We also looked at a timeline of uh, key dates in Canadian history. And uh, there was a quote about the Indian residential school system. It was similar to the quote that Tanya showed last night, where it talked specifically about the need to remove Indian chil children from their savage parents. And I looked at my seven-year-old, because we talk about this a lot, and I said, Myla, that means that even 100 years ago, even 50, 60 years ago, if you had been born, they would have wanted to take you from me. And we just kind of looked at each other for that moment. And in my head, what I was also reflecting on was the mass apprehension of Indigenous kids and how often this state actually still sees Indigenous moms and parents in that way and still wants to take their kids. So part of the reason that I almost canceled all of my talks was because of the deafening silence from health organizations in the wake of the injustice. Because I see slides like this and I work directly with urban Indigenous youth um, and I knew from talking with them and supporting them about the impact that it was having on them. And I knew that the loudest voices they were hearing from the Canadian public were telling them that they just needed to stop drinking or they would get what was coming to them. So the silence from organizations that had a stated goal of reconciliation or a stated goal of health equity for Indigenous people seemed more complicit than supportive. So I think of the gardener's tale, I think of our youth, I think of the seven, fall or fe seven fallen feathers and the way that they are growing up. And too many of our kids are still growing up on the verge of starvation, literally and otherwise, that John A. Macdonald referred to. Our kids have the right to grow up in healthy families and communities with equal access to the upstream determinants of health as we define them including connection to land, culture, language, and cultural practices. We need to dramatically shift the balance from the trauma and the stressors that our children and youth are exposed to, and we need to dramatically strengthen access to the coping mechanisms rooted in cultural identity and connection to family, community, and language that really protect and nurture our health. So when I think about the next 150, if we want it to be different than the past 150, I think we need to challenge and change the public discourses of Indigenous people. Discourses that quite frankly um, continue notions of our inferiority, as I mentioned, that tell our kids and our youth that they just need to not drink or they'll get what's coming to them. And the parallel discourse that says that white farmers are just hardworking people protecting their land. And I would state openly, particularly, frankly, if you will look at that work from Barner Hess, that it is predominantly the responsibility of white people who define themselves as allies to do that hard work of shifting that discourse amongst their peers. I think that we need to explicitly see inaction and delayed action as forms of racism that someone is actually benefiting from that delay or from that inaction. Someone is actually upholding those systems of whiteness and indigenous inferiority for a reason. I also think we need to realize that anything or something is not better than nothing. In fact, sometimes it's worse. Because if that anything or that something is based in charity and is not based in rights to equity, then there's no accountability to actually measure and demonstrate equitable outcomes. And we cannot settle for anything less than progress towards full equity. And I think we need to really focus on our youth. As I mentioned before, sometimes, quite often, the loudest voices they hear either loudly or because of what they see when they look around in their communities, is that they are less valuable to Canadian society than other youth. Um, 
that they are worth less and that they deserve less. Changing that has to be our focus. If we wanna have a 150 years from now that is different than the past 150. The youth that I work with um, are my greatest sense of hope. I think that they have the energy, um, optimism, strength, knowledge, skills, and ideas um, that really will uh, be able to push us forward without some of the sometimes layered cynicism uh, that we develop in our middle age. So I really want us to encourage on making space for youth leadership, Indigenous youth leadership, um, and ensuring that the voices that they hear are voices that value them more than anything else. So thank you for having me today. Padamia Matakoyasin.